Hi, my name's Tim. I'm gonna give you the case of the missing light curtain. This presentation is a culmination of years of study and research and then also just very, quite, quite basic, a case study um, brought to you by virtue of a company I can't mention. Um, but I will tell you all the details in this and I just wanna quick give you an introduction to who I am and what I do. Um, I've been with the American Society of Safety Professionals for a little over 20 years now. I am on the Society Board of Directors um, in addition, I do have a full-time job. I'm a senior consultant with Safe Start. I've been with them for 17 years, and I've written a couple of books. The first one was a textbook at the university, um, university level, and that was Safety, Health, and Security in Wastewater. And I also wrote a self-help book called The Core of Four, Four Tools to Help Navigate to Great Human Performance. I've received a few accolades, but I won't necessarily give all of those now, but I wanna tell you, I love safety. And to me, there's nothing more important than sending people home at the end of the day. And we say it all the time as safety professionals, but in order for us to get to our most important things, which is usually family or the things that we like to do, we've got to navigate right now. So that's the culmination of this case study to me. And what really got me immersed into saying, I'm going to spend more time in prevention than reaction. But this story is the case of the missing light curtain. And so what I'm gonna do is talk to, talk to you a little bit about the company. I'll tell you a little bit about the story of what happened in this situation or this case study. We'll talk about the review, the revision, and the results, and then I'll summarize at the end. So without further ado, let's get started. Company, I can't say their name, but I think you probably over time can figure out who this company is. They were an underwater cable manufacturer, and they actually employed over 30,000 people throughout the globe mostly in North America, but they had facilities all over the place, and I actually got a chance to visit every one of them. It primarily started in the United Kingdom, but they were purchased by a three-letter company, and this three-letter company, I think all of you have heard them before, but again, I can't say their name. So the company was responsible for manufacturing this underwater cable through extrusion of parts, twisting a cable, like basically it was twisted pair of copper, insulated copper, and twisting that to a point where it actually started to create a massive cable. And if you wanted to, you could take a look at your calf and that would be the thickness of that cable. So to put that into perspective, I probably have the biggest calves on earth and that's probably because of my Polynesian background, but that's literally the size or the circumference of this cable. So fairly big. And so with the cable itself, you go into this facility, any of their facilities, you're gonna see reels reels and reels and reels of this cable. And these reels sometimes are eight to 10 feet high. And these reels come off of take up reels, they come off off the floor, um, they're shipped around by cranes, they're moved around by forklifts, they're heavy. And the cables, if you, if you could figure it out, they're rolled around these reels. And so over, over, you know, over time, they do get, they get, they get very heavy. And so they move around the facility. And so again, I can't share the name of the company, but I can share some images that I've captured by permission. And you can see the thickness of that cable. There's a human on the, with their shoulder holding that cable up from the reel. And so the incident, I was given a phone call by a United Kingdom uh, executive, and they asked if I could come in and have a conversation with them about machine guarding. They didn't really give me all the information up front, and I said, I, I would love to. And they said, we're gonna pay for everything. We'll, we'll even upgrade you to business class. And I was like, how can I? How can I turn this down? So I flew to the United Kingdom and we had a conversation. There's several folks came in from the United States um, from all over the globe. And we basically sat down and first few words out of their mouth was, well, we had a fatality last month. And I, I said, well, you couldn't tell me that on the phone. Anyways, uh, we got past all the, the subtleties of the introduction, but I, I literally just got to a point where I was like, well, why? And for those of you that are familiar with five whys, I literally wanted to ask 15 whys. And I couldn't get down to the nitty gritty about why they literally had this problem. So hence, they hired me as a third party consultant to lead their teams to come up with an initiative to prevent the failure from happening again. And so we went through a lot of inspections and we went to a lot of their facilities to look at these reels. And this photograph on the left hand side, it's the take up reel where the incident occurred. And it's just ironic how it happened. There's resilience that happened in this, uh, but there wasn't resilience engineering. 
and I'll tell you a little bit about it. On the right hand side, you actually see the extrusion. And once the extrusion process is done, once the twisted pairs are all collected, insulation is added, and then it goes right up to a take up reel, as you can see on the left hand side. And so the employee, when they're done filling up the reel, they have to cut that with a massive knife. And this knife goes across and it just basically shears that cable right where it needs to be. And in order for the employee to jostle the cable back and forth on the take-up reel, what they end up doing is they don't have a handle, they didn't have anything created, so they took up some shrink wrap. And so they wrapped this shrink wrap around and around and around until it eventually created a rope-like loop. Literally was wrapped around the cable, and so they used that as a handle, and they were able to jostle the cable back and forth. So they were jostling. And the tragedy of the jostle is they left the cable as the reel was rolling, and then they stepped back into where they are literally supposed to be, but the cable wrapped around and it kept going around on the take up reel. And eventually that shrink wrap loop did grab their foot. And when the foot was grabbed with that loop on shrink wrap, it took them into the take up reel. And since there was no brakes or emergency stops added, it just kept rotating. Now, I don't necessarily have to give you the rest of the details, but I think you can understand. And that's where the fatality occurred. And so you can see why I have 15 questions. And so a lot of the questions didn't get answered. We don't know why, why that employee did that. We don't know why. Uh, we don't know why there's not an emergency stop. We don't know why there's not a light curtain for somebody that goes beyond a certain area. We don't know why. And I brought in what I thought was the best solution and that is ISO 14121. Here in the United States, we would call it ANSI B11TR3, which, it, which is it's basically the machine guarding standard and how to conduct a risk assessment in a facility. And so the risk assessment was never done. They never did a machine guarding full-blown inventory. They had no idea. They just said, you need to stand here and do your work. Well, eventually they got to a point where these things were being shipped out so fast that the employee had to jostle the cable back and forth on the reel to make sure it was in the right location. And then eventually that reel went off to be prepared for shipping. And so when we opened up ANSI B11 TR3, we found a risk matrix that not everybody was familiar with. So we had to develop this team. And unfortunately, it was in reaction to the fatality. Well, okay, I know what we're trying to do is be preventative and try to be proactive but you have to start somewhere. And unfortunately, it started with the shed of tears. And in this case, this team was very generous in terms of their time. So we created a team that consisted of a safety professional. We had a third party, myself. And of course, we had added an engineer, an operator, and a mechanic from the maintenance department. And so this team was responsible for doing a risk assessment together on every piece of equipment. And so we finished up in the United Kingdom, we ended back up in Phoenix, where I'm from, and then we went all over the world. And so this risk assessment came from ANSI B11 TR3. Similar from the ISO 14121 standard, and literally, if you're familiar with risk assessment, you see severity, you see likelihood. And what we ended up doing is making decisions on a pathway forward using the hierarchy of controls which of course is right here in both of these standards. And I'll tell you, time to go, I, I literally had to travel. And you wanna talk about the beginning of my travel? I, I literally started traveling all over the world because of this job. And I'm perfectly fine with that because we were now making an impact. We went from the United States, went all over the globe. And now that we're back into the United States, we ended up rewriting the procedure that we generated and it took us three years to do all of this work which i was fine with because we didn't have another fatality as a matter of fact we didn't have another serious injury that was recordable in this regard from a machine guarding perspective and they had 15 up to the fatality and so human factors were involved but in terms of this recommendation in terms of what we did to go back to the work that we started we, we found out that they needed light curtains. Light curtains would actually introduce the stopping of the mechanism. Now those reels are so heavy that if it did engage a stopping mechanism, it was so heavy that it would continue to rotate, which could still you know, cause an injury. 
So in this case, we had light curtains, and then we also added brakes and clutches. So as soon as the human engaged the light curtain, the actuator would go right in, and it would stop that brake. So that way there was no continuation of the weight of those reels. And since there wasn't an emergency stop in the location, every single piece of equipment, especially if it was a take-up reel, ended up getting an emergency stop with the addition of the brakes, which eventually, if you hit it, would stop the mechanism completely. Now, I know that's a lot of inertia and a lot of stuff to stop, a lot of weight, um, but at least we, were, you know, we would prevent an employee going in there. And a lot of folks would ask, too, at the very end of all of these recommendations, did we create a larger problem? And we believe the answer is no. With that emergency stop stopping, at least we would, we would know that the employee was not in the location to be brought back up into the take-up reel. Now, we found out through further investigation that if those things kept rotating, that the heaviness of the cable coming around would actually get loose and come off, and it actually hit people before. So that's been prevented as well. And what's best about all of this is we got employee involvement, we got employee ownership, especially from the operator and the mechanic, and more importantly, every facility, whether they were fully aware of the fatality or not, we got management buy-in. So if you look at the overall safety management systems as they're put together, having employee participation and ownership and management buy-in, those are two huge components. And we didn't expect that going in, but we got it going out and we were really grateful for that. So to summarize, big companies can fail. This is a big company, three letter company, they can fail. And we also found the need for collaboration. And without the collaboration, I honestly don't think that we would have been able to come up with a single solution. Even though our risk scores were all over the place, everybody got their voice and their voice was heard. To me, soft skills in that regard, that's extremely important. Even though the hard skills conducting the risk assessment is out there, I would say that the, the communication skills and all the skills that people developed working in a group, that's, that's a lot bigger to me than the hard skills of doing the actual assessment. So finally, the risk matrix, we found its way into operational excellence. Not only did they do it for machine guarding, they did it for everything else. They did it for quality. They did it for standard deviations. All those deviations that came in, um, they use this risk assessment matrix to prevent things from happening, not just in safety, but also in productivity and quality. So overall, their business succeeded in many different areas, not, not, just, not just safety. And then finally, operators, they got a chance to use ingenuity to get things done. And in this case, you could go back and argue that that person created a shrink wrap loop, almost a rope tight loop in ingenuity. But in this case, when they came back as operators, they didn't wanna they didn't want to have the outcome that happened in the United Kingdom. So their ingenuity and the risk assessment, they came up with a lot of solutions that, you know, quite frankly, the machine guarding team wouldn't have never thought of. And so we were grateful for that. So overall, we got a lot of ingenuity. So in this case, we've got really good uh, operators and mechanics coming together for collaboration. And then we finally, we install the, and it has a safety management system in ISO 14121 international standard and in the United States the similar one for ANSI B11 TR3 and it turned out to be a really good job unfortunately we reacted but it eventually ended up being very proactive